Welcome to Food for Thought. Today's episode is Living a Meaningful Life, Creating Surprises. Before we begin, my name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com. You can find me on social media and you can find my books wherever books are sold. I hope you join me in one of my online cooking classes or in one of my all-inclusive vegan trips around the world. This podcast is listener supported. So if it's something you value and you'd like to enjoy some perks, head over to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to become a supporter today at your chosen level. Thank you so much in advance for supporting, for subscribing, and for listening. Hi there. I hope you're doing fabulously well. Several years ago, I produced a podcast episode called 50 Ways to Create a Meaningful Life. And since then, I've taken a few of those 50 and elaborated on those topics and made their own individual episodes. And that's what we're going to do today. I have heard from so many of you who really appreciated that episode, The 50 Ways, but also the individual episodes on living a meaningful life. And so I want to just make sure we're still adding those to our repertoire. So today's episode is on creating surprises, which was number 39 in the 50 ways to create a meaningful life. Now making plans includes creating surprises, making plans, and I'll talk more about that. And number 40 was be spontaneous. So it's both of those things. But make plans, creating surprises is something we're going to talk about today. Now, It's really funny because lately the concept of the five love languages has come up in my life. I don't know why. I skimmed the book many years ago, but I haven't read it in its entirety. This is uh, the idea of the five love languages is based on a book called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And uh, it's a concept that has really resonated with a lot of people. It hasn't been a guiding principle in my life, but it's been coming up lately so much that I decided to kind of use that as a framework here. Uh, The premise of the five languages is that different people with different personalities give and receive love in different ways. And the idea is that by learning to recognize these preferences in yourself and in your loved ones, you can identify what you love, you can identify conflicts, you can connect, you can grow closer. And that's the idea. What's really funny is I had already written this episode And I'm not kidding. Last night, I went into bed early and I opened the New York Times. And one of the headlines was specifically about the five love languages and Gary Chapman and about how how he came to create these five love languages and how there hasn't been a sixth one, even in the 20 years that he's been um, that that these books have become very popular. So I'm using this as a framework. This episode is not about the five love languages, so just bear with me here. So the five love languages are acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, words of affirmation, and physical touch. Now, these don't just apply to people in romantic relationships. These apply to all relationships. So like I said, Today's episode is not about the five love languages, and this is not about a romantic relationship, so don't turn this episode off if you think, well, this isn't for me. I've got a point here. So because this has been coming up a lot, I, David and I were taking a hike recently. We were on a hike, and I said, okay, so here's the five love languages. What do you think? What do you think yours are? And when we went through them, and again, I'm no expert at all, but when we went through them, What we identified kind of for both of us was acts of service, quality time, and words of affirmation, all being at the top. And then you can even do a quiz like at fivelovelanguages.com. And I actually did it because I was like, okay, let me just do it. It took five minutes. And it confirmed what I identified. And it confirmed what David identified. Now, this wasn't a surprise to either of us when we were talking about this because acts of service, doing things for each other is a huge part of our relationship. But it's fun. Anyway, it's fun to have this this language and a framework for understanding aspects of ourselves and our loved ones. And so in identifying these, I was like, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. We spend a lot of quality time together. We really love being with each other. And we do acts of service for one another. Acts of service sounds so formal. We love doing things for each other. We like helping each other and we do things for each other. It brings us a lot of joy to do that. So much so that 
a very long time ago, we actually built this into our lives, namely creating surprise experiences for each other. So for my part, I have always loved creating surprises, always. It's in my DNA. Ever since I was little, I would love to surprise my parents. I loved the element of surprise, more giving than receiving, to be honest. I'm a bit of a control freak, so receiving surprises can be harder for me because I like to know what's going on at all times, but I've gotten better with that for sure. But I love surprise I love surprising people. I threw a surprise birthday party for my mother's 55th birthday, I remember a very long time ago, and another one for her 75th. You know, big ones like that. Of course, those are obvious surprises. I've thrown many surprise parties for David over the years, and I'm quite proud of being able to hmm, keep a secret and be a bit manipulative with with friends and all of the cohorts who are helping me scheme behind the scenes. I really love doing that. I love just having this plan where I'm rubbing my hands together and kind of coming up with it and, and concocting the story to set it up and then reveal it, right? So it's just one of my favorite things to do. And even the smallest surprises, it doesn't have to be big surprises like parties. So it could be, you know, creating a dinner, you know, or having the table set and having it all beautifully done. Um, it could be, uh, you know, I, I like throughout the year um, kind of devising the presents that I would give friends or David at the end of the year for Christmas. So I'll, I'll kind of plan that throughout the year and I keep them in their own special box. Now, yes, granted, those are things, those are gifts, physical gifts, but still just like creating the plan. And that's one of the things that when we're talking about creating surprises, I think it's one of the things that makes them really special is that you're putting so much thought into them. And you have to really think several steps ahead in order to lead up to the reveal, right? So big, small, doesn't matter. The idea is that you are putting thought into creating the surprise for someone. So I don't know how it started exactly, but it was at least two decades ago because David and I have been married for over 20 years and we've been together for 27 years. And I remember this, we were doing this before we were married. So what we decided to do was create planned surprises for one another. And I remember, I've been talking about this for years and every buddy I've ever talked to about this has been very inspired to to do it because it is a way because you know your life is busy and you're you're you know you're doing things and whatever whatever this creates an intentional way of doing something special for the people you love so the way this planned surprises work is that we would just check in with each other and again you can do this with friends parents partners it doesn't matter and we'd say hey do you have do we have plans on the 20th of august and we'd look at the calendar nope nope no nope. okay great i'm planning a surprise i got a surprise okay great so it goes on the calendar as surprise for bella david calls me bella i call him bello whatever surprise for bella surprise for bello and it goes on the calendar the problem the only problem with this is that after the surprise is over, we never remember to change the calendar event from the vague and generic surprise for Bella to the thing we actually did, or surprise for Bella, to the thing we actually did. So we usually have a really hard time remembering surprises when people ask us for examples. And for decades, I remember people have been like, tell us some, like, what are some surprises you do? And I'm like, I've, give me a minute. Like, I have to, we have to think. And we do them every other week or so and we still have to we still have to think about them and I'm loath to say that I haven't kept like a running list of the surprises we've done over the last couple decades there have been a lot but I can remember a few and, and I'm going to talk about them in kind of general categories to help spark some ideas for you because obviously the things we choose for each other are very specific to the things we love and you know I choose things that I know David loves he chooses things he knows I'll love but you can customize these generic ideas t to your liking. And so basically, and I want to hear some of your ideas too, because it's really fun. It's really fun to to devise these surprises. So I'm going to share with you some of these surprises. I'll su share with you the biggest surprise, which was also a surprise fail, which was David's proposal to me. 20 years ago. Um, so stay tuned for that. And uh, I'll give you some, uh, some other ideas. So when we talk about kind of the kind of surprises we do, right? 
concerts is a big one. Now, let's just all pretend we have, you know, COVID is not an issue as much anymore. And obviously, it's becoming less of a of a of a thing we have to be so concerned about that we can't go to an outdoor concert or an indoor concert knowing what we have to do to do that safely. So concerts is a big one. I, I, I'm not a huge concert goer, even pre-COVID. I don't like stadium concerts, like huge, large, like I don't like huge spaces like that. David doesn't either. But we do like seeing shows in smaller venues. And there are some bands I never miss when they're in town. Nick Cave, Lowe, Sigaros, a few others. And David knows who I love, and so he's very good at, you know, kind of paying attention to when they're coming to town. My favorites, I'm also paying attention to when they're coming to town, but David's pretty good at that. Recently, I got tickets for us to see Cigaros in Palo Alto as a surprise for David. Now, I realize that some of the surprises for David, uh, are they're also treats for me, because it's probably going to be unlikely that I'm going to go to a concert that I don't like, but I could get tickets for him. Like that could be an example of a surprise. Like I would get tickets for him to go with a friend. But sometimes the the surprise for him is also a treat for me. We can both benefit. That doesn't take away from the the joy. It doesn't take away from the surprise. David uh, turned me on to Cigaros many years ago, and I absolutely love them. He loves them. We saw them in uh, Berkeley at the Greek Theater. It's a large uh, open outdoor amphitheater in Berkeley. We saw them years ago. But the fact that they were on tour and playing locally post-COVID, you know what I mean when I say that, was really special because we hadn't we hadn't seen them in years and it was just really good. They weren't our first post COVID concert. I think Nick Cave was when he came back around after things started calming down. But it was wonderful to be able to or I was excited to go see them again, Cigaros. So I saw that they were coming and I said to David, it was on a weekday, which meant he was gonna have to leave work early. So I said, Do you have any plans? Would you be able to leave work early on this day? He said, yes. I said, okay, putting a surprise down. We're going to have to leave a little early. And we did. And we drove down to Wild Seed, which is a wonderful vegan restaurant. They started in San Francisco. They now have one in Palo Alto as well. We're actually going there today because we're heading down to a a special wine event at one of the wineries we're members of. And we're going to stop at Wild Seed on the way with a friend. So Wild Seed is wonderful if you're ever in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we had dinner at Wild Seed and then we uh, were going to the concert. Now, by dinner, I think I decided to reveal it to him because I needed his help kind of figuring out where we're going to park and where we're going to go, something like that. So so I think I revealed it, but I still like making him guess because, again, I love, I love, I think, drawing out the surprises as well, building it up. So I think I made him guess and we did a 20 questions or something like that. And I told him that we were going to see Cigaros. It turned out to be, I want to say one of, I might just say the best concert we've ever seen. It was unbelievable. So anyway, so that was like super fun. So surprises when it comes to music, concerts, whatever the venue, even if you don't go, if it's if it's a band or a singer you know is coming to town and it could be even out of town. I have friends who follow um, another band we love is The National and we have friends who love The National as well. They have followed them from town to town so you can make a weekend of it if you know a band is coming, you know, they're going to be in a state nearby but they're not coming to your state, you know, make a weekend of it. That's a super, super lovely surprise. It doesn't have to just be a one-off thing. It could be a weekend. It could be a trip. So concerts, music, et cetera. Related to that, plays, theater. David has surprised me with a lot of theater. Now we'll go, we have like, you know, often season tickets to like Shakespeare in the Park or a local theater here or opera in the park. Um, but there's a lot of small theaters around here and David loves kind of going and seeing what they're doing. And he has surprised me with a lot and a lot of just really kind of avant-garde, kind of smaller theater companies. And they're, I, I, some of them are just the most wonderful, memorable experiences. And it's really fun. So here's an example of a recent one. David said to me, 
So I knew surprise for Bella was on the calendar. And he just said, we need to leave by this time. We are walking there. So, you know, whatever. Wear com- I always ask, what do I have to wear? So we wear comfortable shoes. He said, we're going to need food. So we're going to have to leave a little earlier if we're going to go pick up food. But if you want to make food, we can leave at this time. And I was like, absolutely going to make food. He's like, so we're eating there. And then it's going to be about three or four hours. There's a break in between. And that's the deal. Oh, okay. So uh, so I made a bunch of food. David brought wine and glasses. We have a little backpack with wine, a little wine cooler <laughs> section. And we get to a local park that we never go to. And it's actually within walking distance of our house. It's just this little park. Well, it's more than a little park. It's a park. And we get there. And I was like, oh, my God, this is cool. Like, we haven't been here in forever. And I can see that some people are starting to set up what looks like a, you know, kind of makeshift stage in the park. And people are sitting on blankets and starting to set up. And indeed, we set up our blanket. We get out our our wine, our food. And it was this wonderful, tiny, small theater company called the Peripatetic Players. And they were performing what was called uh, Lord of Lord of a Ring in a Suitcase. What was the subtitle? I think it was a trilogy in two parts. <laughs> so it was this absolutely adorable kind of comedic rendition of Lord of the Rings and I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan not only the books but the movies and this play was based most mostly on the movies and so there would be even uh, music from the movie that they were singing or playing or humming or whatever and the audience there was audience participation and it was absolutely adorable and hilarious and wonderful so it could just be something like so he and I said how did you hear about this and he said I was at a cafe and I saw there was a poster for this and of course he knows I love Lord of the Rings so he he just decided it was it was free it was a donation only when we got there but so he's like yep I was like that's what we're gonna do so so we just do a lot of these things on the weekend so when we first started doing these surprises for each other we alternated months And it would be, you know, July, David would be like, okay, I'm doing a surprise for you this month. And then August, I would do the surprise. Now it's really all the time. We just all the time are constantly devising surprises. And it really is a huge part of our scheduled uh, events. Now we're, you know, we still make dinner plans and we still buy tickets for theater that we don't do surprises for because, you know, and for instance, um, Uh, Films, for instance, is another one. So we belong to the Pacific Film Archive, or we'll decide to go to the uh, San Francisco Silent Film uh, Festival, or we'll go to the Film Noir Festival. Well, we like to pick those films together that we're going to go see. So those aren't surprises. We we will go to see those films, uh, you know, as part of a, a festival, and we'll pick the films together. So that's not a surprise. But I mentioned the PFA, the Pacific Film Archive. They have different retrospectives of directors or types of films or films from certain countries. And we, you know, especially during COVID, we got away from looking at theater, you know, inside movies, films. And so I started looking again. And so that was a surprise. I said, okay, surprise, Friday night, put it on the calendar and and we left and he didn't know what we were going to see until we got there now again it was a film that's also one of my favorite films but we happen to share (laughs) we happen to share uh, a lot um of preferences so and likes and dislikes so so again I got to benefit from it as well it was Knights of Kiberia Fellini uh one of his films is Knights of Kiberia one of my favorite films definitely one of my top 10 films and uh we all we went and uh it was wonderful so so you can vary it doesn't have to be surprises all the time but but a lot of our events are surprises they're not all gems and i think the point i'm making here and you can hear this in how i'm telling the story is obviously we know each other very well and that's something that comes with being together for a very long time, but that's also part of how you get to know someone and how you deepen the relationship is, you know, is kind of paying attention to a hint that they might drop or something they just might say. One of the things I may have talked about this in the 50 um, ways to create a meaningful life episode is when it comes to physical gifts, and this could be experiences as well, 
I actually keep a list, a Google Doc of just, you know, gifts or just preferences of friends and family and husband. And so if someone mentions something like, oh, we just went to this winery. Yeah, it's our favorite winery. We love this wine. Uh, I'll be like, okay, what was the winery? And what was that again? Or if someone says, oh, I can't stand Chardonnay or I don't like IPAs or I love you know, I don't know, California Zinfandels. It doesn't have to all be alcohol. (laughs) You know, um, this is my favorite chocolate. This is my favorite ice cream. This is my favorite whatever. Making those notes so that when it comes time for an occasion or a special occasion like a birthday or a holiday to give gifts or present gifts or to present experiences, then you know what they've said. So I realize that, you know, David and I have been together a long time and we really know what each other likes, but that it it just means paying attention to the person who's in your life who you want to um, create experiences for. They're not all gems in the very beginning. So this would have been, oh my gosh, this probably was Oh, gosh, it was, let's just say 20 years ago. It was a long time ago. And I had a friend who was visiting. Yeah, it was in our old house. So were we married yet? We, it, it would have been about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. No, it was in our old apartment. It would have been about 20 years ago. So a friend was visiting from New Jersey. She was one of my uh, best friends from from high school. And she was visiting, and it was for my birthday. And David arranged a surprise at this, you know, in San Francisco at some pl- place. That's all I knew. <laughs> it was a location I wasn't familiar with. And so it was so funny. So a bunch of friends, I don't think the surprise, I, I, I don't think the friends being there was a surprise. I think the, I think the, the location and the event was the surprise. So some friends came to dinner. We went to dinner first for my birthday. And then we went to this location And I think maybe some friends showing up was a surprise. So a bunch more friends showed up uh, who weren't there for the dinner. And more and more people started showing up. And it was in this old warehouse. And in this old warehouse, they screened films. And these random films, whatever they were, I don't know exactly how it worked. But it was just this guy who owned this warehouse and made it a public venue or maybe a private venue so you could – rent the space and a film was being shown so the film that was being shown that night (laughs) was a film called Zardoz so if you've not heard of Zardoz good if you have you're laughing right now so it was a 1974 kind of like fantasy science fiction weird film by John Borman directed by it was actually written I think and directed by John Borman John Borman directed Deliverance which is an incredible film and I think after that film the studio gave him carte blanche to make whatever he wanted and he made this really weird film it is with Sean Connery and Charlotte Rampling who I love and it you just have to see it or maybe you don't. Basically, Sean Connery, he was like in his 50s. He's running around in like a red diaper with like a bandolier. It was just bizarre. And I definitely appreciate it now more than I did then. But then I was like, why Why would you have us watch this movie for my birthday? Like, this is n- nothing I am interested in. Like, it was just bizarre and weird and distracting and he, just weird, you know, it was 1970. So like a lot of like women running around in like bikinis and it was just bizarre. Since then, we've actually seen it at a second run theater here in Oakland. It was probably 15 years later. I'm like, okay, we need to go and see that again. And we did. We went to the Parkway Theater and we, you know, whenever there's, there was like vegan pizza there and we got pizza and beer and whatever. And we watched Zardoz and it was just as awful as the first time. But this time I was able to appreciate a little bit more or appreciate the humor in it. So David did learn, okay, not too weird, not too off the rails, not too much jump in the shark like he did with Zardoz. Uh, so they're not all they're not all winners, but we have never stopped talking about it. We've never stopped talking about it and you have to just go look it up. Just go look at the movie poster. Like it's just hilarious. So another category other than we've done music, we've done theater, opera if you like it, any kind of music, 
T- um, film, TV shows is another one. And of course, these days when there are so many good television series out and it's really become, you know, just a really exciting thing to find a really good TV show. David's really good at finding and he know he really does know what I like. So I think maybe he learned from the Zardoz experience, <laughs> but um, he really does know what I like. I think he was trying something different and it just didn't work. But he will, he knows what I love. And so he will say, I found something for us. We're going to watch it. And I'm like, okay. I don't know why I'm ever skeptical because it's always really good. The best example I have of this when I was skeptical was he said, I have a TV show for you. It's a surprise. And I said, okay. And he said, it's animated. This would have been five years ago. And he said, it's animated. And I like animated. I mean, I love the Sim- Simpsons and, you know, that kind of thing. But I, you know, we don't watch a ton of animated. I haven't watched every animated show. And he started describing how the people who made this show that he wants us to watch were people who made this other show. Now I'm forgetting the name of it. C-Lab. Um, that was on like, was it the comedy channel or something like that during this like very specific kind of interim between shows called Adult Swim? So he started describing Sea Lab and it sounded like a sh- an animated show that was like perfectly appropriate for, you know, boys, you know, 15 year old boys or something like that. And I was like, OK, so the same people who made that show that doesn't sound interesting to me at all made this show you want me to watch. OK. And he's like, just watch it. It, I think you'll like it. I'll put, well, why don't we just put on a random episode and you'll see if you like it. So I was like, fine. So he puts on the random episode and it was Archer. And I was like, I'm in. Like in the first 60 seconds, I'm like, I'm in. This is amazing. And Archer has become one of our favorite, all-time favorite shows. In fact, we just finished watching the most recent uh, season and just we just finished it. So did I say just, we just started watching it? We just watched the last because we we put a pause on it because there was there were some kind of weird things happening. So we put a pause on it. But anyway, the point is he was right. He knew me. He surprised me. We he was right, and we did it. So David's going to come out looking really good in by the way in all of these because he is the one. He probably creates more surprises than I do, but I think because his tend to be more like the events that I've named, you know, the the plays, that kind of thing, the TV shows, sure. I tend to do a lot more around like dinners and ex- like the experiences around the the kind of, how should I say this? I mean, experiences like like eating and drinking and walking and, you know, those kinds of things that aren't necessarily a destination or a thing that we're doing. It's a, it's an experience we're having. Now, all of these are, but I'm trying to see if I could find a way to differentiate because when I was looking at the calendar and I asked David, I'm like, can you get, can we, where we need, I need examples for this episode. I couldn't find any that I like, that I've done recently. I mean, except for the concert, the Cigarettes concert, but I do them all the time. Mine would be something like, "Okay, come down at six o'clock. I have a surprise for you," and it could be that I made like mozzarella sticks because he'd been talking about mozzarella sticks, and you know, I made them with my cashew mozzarella that I make and. And you know, I'm not going to write that down on the calendar, right? So, so I, the, the surprises don't have to all be, you know, a, a destination. They can be the, these experiences, and I don't necessarily write them all down. It'll be, hey, tonight for dinner, I have a surprise for you, and then I'll set the table outside with candles and make a dinner, right? That kind of thing. So dinners, drinks, uh, a picnic. I'll do that a lot. So I will plan a picnic. It could be a picnic outside in our back yard. I did that in our old house, like have a blanket outside. It could be a, um, yeah, those kinds of things. So the dinners, the food, picnics, that kind of thing. That's something I I love to do. Speaking of the outdoors, another one are hikes. So David, again, he's the hero in this episode, obviously. He, He loves finding new hikes. And you know, I hike several times a week. I tend to go to the same place because I just want to go on the hike on the, you know, at the place I know just to not have to think about it and look at a trail map. So there are hikes that I do regularly and David does as well. And on the weekends, David loves to find new hikes. And we live in an area that has, we are just very lucky in any direction we can go and just, just, just get on the trails. There are just so many. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface and we've been hiking around here for 20 years. 
23 years. So so he loves finding new hikes. And so he'll often say, okay, I've, we're going on a new hike, dress appropriately. The only fail that's ever happened with, it was not a fail, but yeah, I mean, he almost killed me because he chose a hike that was in the middle of you know, the day, one of the hottest times of the year, and we didn't have enough water. And I was like, okay, we can't finish the hike. We we really couldn't finish the hike because we didn't have enough water. And it was the hottest day ever. Not that it was, you know, he didn't, you know, he hadn't been on this trail before, but I was like, you've got to give me preparation. And I like to have preparation if we're going to do a big hill. So I don't like just getting on a trail. Again, this is a little bit of the control thing, right? I don't like not knowing something. I need to know something. So like, you don't have to tell me where we're going or what the, you know, what the details are, but just tell me, is it a lot of uphill? How many miles is it? And so basically, so so I know how to dress and how much water to take. That's it. So but we do a lot of that. So David creates a lot of hikes. And I love that because I don't have to think about it. And he's already made the plan. <laughs> Another one, again, David, hero. He has been finding a lot of botanical gardens. So we've always loved visiting gardens. One of our favorite gardens, if you are ever in Cape Town, and if you are coming on our Botswana, South Africa trip this year, we do go to Cape Town. We start and end in Cape Town. And Table Mountain, there's a botanical gardens at the top of Table Mountain, which are absolutely incredible. And so go there. We've not stopped talking about these. And we're actually going back when we go back in December this year. But so David's always looking at botanical gardens in the, you know, in the Bay Area. We're willing to drive a couple hours or whenever we travel, we, we, we look for what botanical gardens might be nearby. So we've been doing that a lot lately when, and we've been finding some really lovely ones. We were just down in Santa Cruz. We hadn't been in Santa Cruz in years. So it was fun to just go to a place we hadn't been to in a long time and had lunch in Santa Cruz and then went to this, the botanical gardens there up by the Arboretum. There was a butterfly and bee garden. There was a fragrant garden. There's a new Zealand section, there's an Australia section, there's a California native section, there's a South Africa section. So it's really fun. So botanical gardens is another category of surprises. And then I mentioned food where that tends to be more up my alley. Breakfast, breakfast in bed, a weekend making waffles or pancakes or something like that. And then counties, you know, the trips, I mentioned doing trips also for concerts, but just trips can be surprises. It doesn't have to be, you know, an international trip, which obviously would be difficult to plan for two people, you know, and to surprise someone because you might need help with logistics. But unless you're coming on a joyful vegan trip, which you don't have to do anything for. So, but you know, you've heard me talk about the fact that several years ago, probably 10, over 10 years ago now, we were in a county, we were in Calaveras County, and enjoying Stanislaus National, or is it State Park there? Stanislaus, I think it's a state park there. And we were, we went to Murphy's, which is this adorable old Western town that has been converted. A lot of these old Western gold mining towns have been converted to these very cute towns and just beautiful and picturesque and in the mountains. And we thought, gosh, there are so many places in California and we love this state so much. There are so many places we've never seen. So we decided to create a goal to sleep in every county in California. And there are 58 counties in California. And we have now slept in 34 I believe, counties. And it has been wonderful because it brings us to places that we would never spend time in otherwise. We've driven through, you know, we've driven through counties we had never stayed in, but the dedication is staying, It you know, the, the, the goal, the commitment is staying in the county, sleeping at least one night. So it's been wonderful. We have 24 more to go, if I'm doing this math correctly. And we have one coming up next weekend. We're going to Tehama County. And David's already found in Tehama County this old monastery that, like, so he, he's obviously not surprising me with this because he told me all about it. There's a monastery. No, it's a winery that used to be a monastery in, like, France. Like, all of the stones that built this building that is now a winery was from a monastery in France. It's crazy. Like the history is crazy. And every, and here's the thing that happens when we do these counties. We tell people, some counties, people who know California, we'll, we'll name a county and they go, ooh, ugh. And I go, what? Like every county has something, right? 
every county has, I mean, there are people living in these counties, so let's not poo-poo these counties just because we don't think they're going to be up to our standards. And there are some, look, that are probably less inclined politically toward our way of thinking and that kind, you know, that happens, right? And that's partly why we do this is because we want to talk to people who are not, who don't think the way we do. And we have never encountered anyone we were uncomfortable with or it's just, it's just, it expands you. Travel expands your thinking, your experiences, your understanding of the world and your understanding of people. It expands your thinking. It makes you a better person. And even if you're just doing it within your own state, right? Because, you know, California is a big state. Wherever you live, there's going to be places that are different from where you actually reside. And so we love doing this. And the other thing we found in the county we're going to, there's a horse rescue. And that was so apropos, right? Because last week's episode was on the horse expressions. We've got another episode coming up on horse words. And there's a horse rescue in the county that we're going to. So we don't tend to surprise each other with the county because we do have to do logistics and take off and, you know, that kind of thing. And I have to make arrangements for the cats. So he won't just say, we're going away for a weekend without... I mean, I guess he could do that, but he'd have to make arrangements for the things that I usually make arrangements for, which is the gardens and the cats and the house and that kind of thing. However, we will both, once we know the county that we're going to, create surprises within the trip that we're doing. So even though you might not want to create, and you might want to create a surprise, you can do this. I don't know why I'm saying you can't do this. Of course you can. Of course we've made surprises for each other. I've made weekend surprises before we were doing the counties. For David, I can do that more easily for him because I am the one who takes care of more of the, the house logistics. So I'm the one who could, you know, create, uh, get a cat sitter and then, you know, create a weekend away. I don't know why I was saying I didn't do that. Of course we do that. So so that's what we've done. One of the one of the best surprises was in Inyo County. David had found a Western film museum when we were in Inyo County. Inyo County is where Death Valley is, and it was incredible. If you haven't been to Inyo County, highly recommend it. Death Valley was amazing. The Alabama Hills were incredible. We absolutely loved this county. It's 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 one of our top counties. But there was a Western there is a Western film museum in the town we stayed in, and I love westerns. I know that sounds weird, but I love western films, and so it was really fun to go there. So David had found that and surprised me, and it was really fun because there was a Tesla charger. There were Tesla chargers right behind the Western Film Museum, so it was quite perfect. <laughs> we, would, we went and charged our Tesla, and then we went to the Western Film Museum, and it was great. So there was another one of the counties that we stayed in was, oh my goodness, what was the name of the county? It was Sequoia National Park. Now, this was before... We made our goal to sleep in every county. And I will tell you that when we decided on that goal, we did inc- we did already grandfather in some counties we had already slept in. It had to be that we slept in them together. And it had to be, obviously, here in California. So, so Sequoia National Park, I'm completely blank, because we stayed in a different county. We stayed at the foot, we stayed at the foothills. We didn't stay in Sequoia National Park the first time we went. But uh, so that's why I'm blanking on the, it may have been, okay, I'm blanking. We, we, so anyway, this was one of the counties and this was when, so this would have been in nine, this would have been in 2000, I think 2000. And I'll tell you this, I had a feeling that he was going to propose to me this weekend, that weekend that we were going to Sequoia. It was during the winter time. And we were going cross-country skiing. And it was the most magical place. The sequoias are the most magical trees. They are the oldest, they're the largest living things on the planet. And they, it was a magical time. And this surprise (laughs) was not a good surprise. So I want to tell you about this surprise when David proposed to me when we come back after this quick break. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who supports this work, this podcast, my work, especially my angels, Brooke Boussard and Michal Stone, my heroes, Angelica Lofton, Jennifer Statmiller, Jennifer Watkins, Gerilyn Hilmar, PJ Schuster, Ranjini Mohan, 
and Tina Strassheim, who have been supporting me for such a long time at the hero level. And I want to thank today's featured bestie, Deborah Knutson. Deborah has been such an incredible supporter. And she has been to my conferences. She has been to so many of my online cooking classes. And she has traveled with us. And I'm so grateful that she has been with us to Rwanda. And it's just such a delight to see her every time I see her beautiful smiling face. And I'm so grateful to you, Deborah. Thank you so much for your support. If you would like to join the supporters, I want to give you a reason to maybe join today. I am hosting a patron-only private event. It's a virtual event. And this is the first event I'm doing since 2020, since COVID. And I do see that someday we will be doing, I foresee doing in-person conferences again. But right now, this is going to be a virtual conference. So from wherever you live, if you are a Patreon supporter, if you're a patron, if you're a hero or an angel or a bestie or a benefactor, doesn't matter what level you are, you will you can come to this event. I've already sent out the invitation and registration is open. If you have been a supporter, I'd also love you to join this event. If you're not a supporter, I really encourage you to become a supporter so you can join this event. It is, I'm calling it the Patreon relaunch. I am announcing a lot in this event about where I see my work going, what I'm going to be spending my time on, and how you can be part of that. And so it's going to be a special time. It's for patrons only. And as I said, for former patrons. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be a couple hours on Saturday, September 24th. And you will get the notification if you haven't already reach out to me. If you're a supporter, you'll be you'll see it on your Patreon account. And you'll also be getting it through email. So I'm sending out messages all the time to make sure that you don't miss this event. And you join me and Danielle, who many of you have met at my conferences in my cooking classes, both in person and online. She's been helping me for 15 years or more. And she will be joining us again for this event. So I hope you consider becoming a supporter for this event for many events like this that are going to be happening a lot more. Uh, a lot of really exciting things I'm excited to announce. So please become a patron at uh, patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. And I appreciate your support. So our proposal. I'll make this brief. So by the time 2000 rolled along, it, Dave and I had been together since 1995. So we'd been together five years. And we were living together. We had moved across the country from New Jersey to California. And I thought, we're going away for this weekend. And I just knew that David was going to propose to me. I just knew it. He had no, he hadn't revealed anything. I hadn't found anything. I just had a gut feeling. Now, prior to this, we had started talking about the future. And I think I pointed out the kinds of rings that I like. I don't know. Something like that. Like that was basically the, the gist of it. But that had been happening over time. It wasn't just the weekend before we were leaving for Sequoia. But I was certain he was going to propose. Certain. A hundred percent. I would have put my life on it. Like I would have put money on it that I knew he was going to propose that weekend. So we're cross country skiing. It's beautiful. You're in this forest with these trees, with this red bark and everything else is white and it was completely silent and nobody else around. And at one point we stopped to take a break under, I'm not kidding you. It wasn't even planned. We stopped to take a break under what were two trees at their base. But then as they grew, as they reached the sky, they turned into one tree. <laughs> it was like really symbolic and metaphor. Oh, this is romantic. Amazing. And so he and I did like a little kiss and like, I was so romantic. And I was certain he was going to propose and nothing, nothing. And I was like, if there's any moment, like who, like you couldn't have written this. You couldn't have planned this. We're here alone in this forest among the trees and there's nobody around and the, we're below these two trees that were two trees that grew to one tree like what and don't you know I know that like this is a very traditional I could have proposed to him well that's not how we were doing things right it was clear that David so I was really disappointed this is why expectations don't have expectations I was disappointed 
viscerally disappointed. Not because I wanted to ring and link me. I just was shocked. I, it was it was mostly shock because I really I was hundred percent certain. So we drove home, and David knew I was disappointed and just I I was a lit. I was just like flummoxed. I couldn't understand. Couldn't understand. So the next weekend, he said, or he said the next weekend, we have, we're going on a hike. And I said, okay, we're going on a hike. Now, at the time, I had been a mentor to a young girl. And she came from a family that was very, there was a lot of strain and stress. And, and, and it was a, it was a, it was a difficult situation. And I had, was her mentor and I would spend a lot of time with her. I'd known her since she was like 10 and she was probably now 13. And I still know her. We we still laugh about this day. And I, and I invited her, her name's Janae and I invited her to come with us on the hike. And the night before the hike, Dave, we were at a friend's house and I told David that I asked Janae to come. I was like, Oh yeah, sorry. I forgot to tell you. I asked Janae. And he goes, no, Janae's not coming. I wanted to just have some time with you alone. And I said, well, I asked Janae and I don't want to disappoint her. And I really pushed back and he really pushed back and he doesn't usually push back. And I wasn't reading the signs and he really just wanted me to like just be with him alone. And I didn't want to disappoint Janae. So I pushed back and I said, I'm not going to cancel on her. I like that's part of what she doesn't have is stability in her life. And I don't want to be the person who cancels on her. And I felt really bad, but David was really mad. So he said, fine. Before we go on the hike, can we please have some time at Lake Merritt together? So David and I used to go to Lake Merritt a lot. We used to read poetry there and just just have a, like a nice little morning uh, and, um, you know, like on the weekends. And so I said, fine, fine. He said, well, fine, we'll go to Lake Merritt and then we'll spend some time together and then we're going to go on the hike. And I'm like, fine. It was like this really stressful. So the next morning, this was again in our old apartment, I remember, and he said, we're going, I, we're going to Lake Merritt. I said, fine. So we get the blanket and we get the chairs and we get to Lake Merritt. And he said, oh. And so we sit down and, and he, he, we, he sits me down and I'm sitting down in my little chair and he starts reading something and I go to grab it from him because I'm like, oh, what are you reading? Like he starts reading something out loud and it's like, oh, what is that? And I grab and he pulls it back and he starts just reciting a poem. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right, fine. I'm like, all right, just fine, read the poem, jeez. And then I'm calming down because we're both like really annoyed with each other. <laughs> and he starts reciting a poem. And I go, oh, honey, that's really sweet. That's really lovely. And he had memorized it. And then he recites another one. And it was um, A Passionate Shepherd to His Love by Spencer. Right, it was Spencer. And as he finishes the poem, and it ends with, will you come with me and be my love? He was on his knee and he had presented a ring and asked me to marry him. And I was completely surprised because I did not see that coming when we were having this aggravated, stressful morning going to the lake. Didn't see it coming at all. And so I was like, oh, my God, whatever. Yes, of course. Oh, my gosh. And it was so beautiful. And he had memorized this poem. And when I grabbed the paper from him, it was his notes to, like, just kind of look at it one more time before he recited it, having memorized it. Right? I'm going to cry. <laughs> so then I said, yes, this is amazing. So beautiful. Sweetie, we have to go pick up Janae. And he's like, can we not pick up Janae? Like, can we, like, really? We still have to do that? And I was like, but like now it's like even closer to when I'm supposed to pick her up. And like, I feel really bad. So within like a, within like 20 minutes of me saying yes to this man who just proposed to me, we go drive like a half hour to go pick up Janae. And we go on this hike near her. It was like Mount Diablo. And she was a miserable brat the entire time. So here is this like the day that's supposed to be this joyful day of like, you know, we're going to get married and we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. There's this brat with us who is making the day miserable. The surprise, the fails, they're the, be the best, right? Because we, of course, have never stopped talking about this the way we've never stopped talking about Zardoz. And we're still friends with Janae. She's now, what, 35? And... 
she um to this day and it was really funny because even then she's like you could have called me I was like Janae I didn't want to disappoint you I didn't want to let you down and she's like I know but you could have and we laugh about what a brat she was because she was complaining and she's like this is too long and I'm too tired and I can't do this and um and we'll never forget it and it turned out that David's plan was to propose to me in Sequoia National Forest while we were cross-country skiing in the forest. But something happened with the ring and he had to get it fixed. It wasn't right. It was the wrong ring. Something had happened. So he didn't have it and he wanted to have it. And of course I said to him, you didn't need a ring to propose to me. Like that's ridiculous. But that was David's plan. That's what he wanted. And that's what he, that was meaningful for him. And so because the ring wasn't there for the weekend we were in Sequoia, he didn't want to propose and he didn't do it. So it gutted him that at that moment, when it was obviously the opportune moment to propose, that that he couldn't, that he chose not to, and that I was disappointed, that I was, you know, disappointed. I was. Again, it was mostly, it wasn't like, it was just, I was so surprised because it was, I was certain and I was right. I was right. He was going to propose that weekend, but because the ring wasn't there, he, he didn't want to do it. And so that's when he was like, well, I don't want to drag this out because I knew you were upset and I didn't want to like, you know, now like, okay, what, plan another weekend away somewhere? Like that would have taken time. We had just taken that time off. And so he said, that's when I was like, okay, we'll do it on the hike. And then you invited Janae. So I was like, okay, I'll squeeze this in at the lake because I don't want you to be upset and I don't want you to feel like, yeah. So that was a surprise (laughs) that turned into quite a debacle. And it's wonderful because we can laugh at it. I mean, I'm tearing up just thinking about it, but we can laugh at it now. And it is the most memorable, most memorable thing ever. But so have all of the small surprises. And it's just a wonderful way to create the anticipation, to plan something for somebody else, to, you know, kind of create, you know, to kind of devise the, the scheme and the, you have to lie a little bit, manipulate situations a little bit. You might have to, to get other people involved and, and help them, you know, get them to help you with your scheme and just the buildup. I think that's why I love creating the surprises because I love all the anticipation. They don't necessarily know the anticipation, but you do if you're creating it, but it's all worth that moment when they, see the reveal when they see the people there because it's a surprise party or a candlelit dinner um, on a blanket in the, you know, in the park or on a beach or a concert that you've always wanted to go to a band you've always wanted to see, or it could just be, a movie that you're going to enjoy together, the time you're spending together. And it, it, it encompasses the quality time. It encompasses the, the acts of service. It encompasses all of these different ways to demonstrate that we love someone. So I hope that's inspired you. And, and I'd love to hear what your surprises are. I could share many more fails with you because th- there are more. <laughs> I'd love to hear if you've had surprise fails and uh, and share your ideas with me. And I hope this inspired you. You inspire me for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thanks for listening. 